This morning we are going to be doing a couple things. Usually I only like to do one per Sunday, but we're going to try to shoehorn in two things. The first is continue our sermon series called the Why Series, which is uh, a sermon series based on locating what is it we're doing here? What's the purpose? Why are we going to church? And what are we doing as the church for Jesus Christ? Uh, I'm a goal person. Y'all know what goals are? Y'all have goals? Keep your scholarship? Is that your goal? What's your goal? Get into college? Depending on your goals, your life orients them, yourself in order to achieve uh, whatever has been convicted on your heart to achieve. Goals change your life. They make you do things you didn't think you could otherwise do. Particularly the goals that Christ has put on us, the, the vision he's given us, not only does that drive us, he's also given us his Holy Spirit, which is a hot fire under our feet that drives us forward. In addition to that, I've asked that our church pause today, since this is kind of the first day of the year. I know liturgically it's Advent. Our church calendar says it's July for some reason. That's the beginning of our church year. But y'all all know church really starts when school starts. And we fly around this calendar year, then we figure out the summer through church camp. Y'all go, by the way, we've got a whole group of people with us from First Christian Midland. We're going to pass the piece here in just a minute, but we're glad you're here today. And with our brave leader TJ's back there leading them. So thanks for coming today. So what we're going to do as a congregation, we're going to encourage y'all to, to be present for y'all's congregation uh, as a sign to renew yourselves before the Lord, asking him as the year begins for a desperate plea for him to renew us with the Holy Spirit that this year can be a power year. It's going to be great that we can be mobilized as his people out into the world. As a, as a matter of uh, business, as a, as a congregation, when we preach, um, and most of y'all know this, that this is a deeply communal activity. It's something that we do together. And that simply means that there's three parties involved. There's obviously a preacher. Y'all have heard a sermon before. The preacher, using the scriptures, leads the church in preaching. There's also the Holy Spirit, which has been guaranteed to be here if there are at least two Christians. And I see at least two, more like 150. But if the Christians have gathered, the Spirit's promised to be here. The third party is sometimes the most limiting party. That's the people. Y'all are part of this preaching moment. And when we show up to church on Sunday, whether it's here, it's at Midland, or at another church, and make a decision to gather under the name of Jesus and preach with God, you'll hear from God. It's not my words. My words are okay, but God will speak to you in between the, the, the silences and in the seams of the word preached and hit you hard in the heart. So I pray that you'll join me today as we preach together. Now, as we continue on with the series, it's, it's under the impre- I'm under the impression that most of us have more to do than we have time to do it with. Are y'all busy? Right? I'm busy. Y'all are busy. I remember uh, first getting out here to Lubbock and was excited that, you know, all my friends from Dallas who come, you know, I knew at church camp will come to, to church and I'll see them and we'll be brother and sister together. And, but when you end up at Texas Tech or in college or in high school as a senior, whatever you're doing, there's a tendency for your plate to fill up pretty quick, Right? School, friends, sorority, fraternity, a lot of band members here. Church is a room for church. There's a whole lesson that could be learned about how do we face the fact that our plates are full. We've got more stuff to do than we have time to do it. How do we follow a process that lets the Holy Spirit tell us what to hold on to and continue to do for him and do even better? And what are we called to let go of? Have y'all ever let let, let go of something hard to let go of? It's called grief or mourning. That's another sermon for another day, but as we face the fact that we have decisions to make with what we do with our time, whether or not we're going to go to youth group and be part of the church, whether we're going to attend church while going through college or continue on later in life, we have to look at the, 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 the aspects that make up our time together with God. And as the pastor of this congregation, I'd like us to start at the beginning of every single year by asking three primary questions before we take another step because I don't want to waste your time. And I don't want to waste God's time. Heck, I don't want to waste my time. And those three questions we're looking at over the next, starting last week and then two to come, the first question was, why does the world need Jesus? Why does the world need Jesus? We spent a whole week, or a whole sermon last week on that topic, but I hope you chewed on that question this week. Why Jesus? I mean, that's why we're here, right? And if he's the reason we're here, shouldn't we have an answer? 
I encourage you to chew on that question this week. Our sermon from last week is on the website if you want to go digest that with our community. But why does the world need Jesus Christ? The second question is where we are today, and that's the question of why does the world need the church? Why church? And next week, and this is a question y'all can ask uh, First Christian Midland, is why does the world need First Christian Church of Lubbock? As in, if we folded our doors and closed everything today, what would the world be missing? Those are hard questions. Those questions are led and lead us toward purpose. They lead us toward playing offense, to recognizing that God has something to do in and through us in the world. And so the second question is the one we're on today. Why does the world need the church? That's a great question. I've heard plenty of people. I believe in Jesus. I keep a Bible by my nightstand. I'm a decent person. I pray. Why go to church? Why be part of the fellowship? After all, church is full of hypocrites. Well, there's hypocrites at Walmart, too. That doesn't keep you from going to Walmart, does it? There's hypocrites everywhere. But I still think that's an excellent question. Why should I use God's time that he's given me to do the churchy thing? Why don't I go, do, why don't I go to, to, to Africa and help people? Why don't I just go meet people on the streets? Those are all great things, and those are great questions. So why do I do that ministry through the church, through the body? Well, God has a story. It's been outlined in this big book called the Bible. We've got a 40-pounder here at First Christian Church. And God's story, we have a tendency to to get real deep in it and get lost in it. Y'all ever get confused by this book? Yeah. And we get lost in the trees sometimes in the details. But according to God's story, if you fly at 30,000 feet and look down and and choose to not get lost and just fly over it for a second, we notice that God has some, some sincere chapters to his story. We see, for instance, that, that this is his story, it's not ours, right? The main character of the Bible, who's the main character of the Bible? God. It's not me, it's not Jesus only. It's Jesus and the Father and the Spirit. It's not King David, it's not Moses. I love Moses, but it's not Moses. It's God. God's story, God's the main character. And according to the Bible, he's got a plan. At the beginning, God created everything. We know that heavens and earth, and he just said it with his word, and stars were thrown up in the sky. He created the world. The second thing God did was he began something called covenants, which was a new thing. No one could really believe that, to have a sovereign God who would humble himself and partner with human beings in order to carry out his mission. That's most of the Old Testament, most of the stories we grew up learning as kids. God partnering with humans to do his work. The third thing is that God in the fullness of time, had something occur for 33 years. It's one of the shortest chapters of his story. It's called the Christ event. God sent his son, Jesus Christ, in the flesh to come and speak on his own behalf. He became, the the word became flesh, dwelt among us, talked for himself, spoke for himself. You know when Jesus was here, no scriptures were written? There was a pause. Prophecy, prophecy, Old Testament, prophecy, prophecy, Old Testament, nothing. Jesus spoke for himself. As soon as he quit talking, everyone started writing again. Jesus, 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 Jesus. For 33 years, God spoke openly and fully by himself through his son, Jesus Christ, the word made flesh. It's through Jesus that we have access to God. Y'all know the name Jesus. It's the the reason we have church. It's the reason we have life eternal. It's, It's all Jesus. And then after that, the story according to the Old Testament that was going to come is that the consummation would come, the completion would come. That's where heaven comes down and kisses the earth, and they become one. They caress and hold each other and love each other and become one, and God dwells openly with his people once again. Scriptures say, just like the Garden of Eden, God will walk with us. We'll be in resurrected bodies. He's going to wipe away every tear from our eyes. He will be our God, and we will be his people. That's the story but there was a wrinkle in the story, a missing chapter in the playbook. We're in it right now. In between Christ and the holy completion, the end, God put in a piece of the story that we didn't really have prophesied. We didn't know about until it happened, until Jesus spoke of it, and that's that he was going to form the church, the bride, the new covenant of God. For some reason, God thought in his own wisdom, between Jesus and the coming kingdom, there would be a period of time 
that would last in order to carry out the trajectory of Jesus' mission, the tidal wave across the world, that, by the way, includes you, apparently. You know, this ministry of Jesus started halfway across the world 2,000 years ago for Jews only. And here we are in Lubbock, Texas, some from Midland, that's okay. We're in West Texas, halfway across the world, thousands of years later, we're Gentiles, and somehow we're here under the name of Jesus. You see why we needed the heir of the church? In his own wisdom, God determined that we as the church, his people, would, through the power of the Holy Spirit, continue the work of Jesus until the fullness of time when the the great consummation comes. He will determine the timing, but he found value to continue this work through sinners like us. It's powerful stuff. So why does the world need the church? Well, God says so. That's a good reason. God says the world needs the church. And, and, and if, if you found out, for instance, that, that you woke up and you're living back in the days of Moses, the Hebrews wandering in the desert, okay? In hindsight, 2020, you know who they are. You know they're God's covenantal people. And you're living there. Would you or would you not sell everything you had to go jump and follow Moses? I would. I want to be part of God's story. I want to be part of his covenantal people. If you found out, for instance, that you lived somewhere on the planet and your life overlapped with a 33-year-long life of Jesus of Nazareth, would you not sell everything you owned, catch a flight, catch a boat, and go get behind him? Amen? Why? Because that's God's story. That's what God was doing primarily at that moment in time. And for some reason, in the wisdom of God, even though I don't get it sometimes, I think God should just bring the end. Have you all ever wondered that? Come on now, where's that kingdom? I'm hurting. But for some reason, God has stalled out over time, maybe so that more may be saved. If you found out, hindsight 2020, that this era of the church was an intended part of God's story, just like creation, just like the old covenant, just like Jesus, and just like the church, if you were living on this planet and you knew that God had a story, wouldn't you want to be part of it? We're the church. Sometimes we're messy. Sometimes our knees are skinned up. But we're the bride. We're his we're part of the story. And so this morning, as we remember who we are in Jesus and recognize that regardless of the congregation we're part of, we are one body in Jesus Christ. We have a mission to engage the world, to be mobilized, to go, whether we're in high school, college, you name it, to go in the hallways through the power of the Holy Spirit and love on people in the name of Jesus. You are the person you've been waiting for. We're the leaders, not the followers. We're the church. Moses didn't ask for permissions from the Hittites before he engaged them. He was the leader. King David didn't ask permission. God anointed him. Jesus definitely didn't ask permission, did he? And the church of Jesus Christ is here to serve a purpose for the world. As we take this Sunday as a day of renewal and remembrance, I want us to to take a moment to break down of who we are, where we come from, what makes us who we are. And, And we know that at the foundation, the basic layer of the church is this cornerstone. And our cornerstone is named Jesus. Scriptures say he's our cornerstone. If you know much about a cornerstone, have you ever built anything? The cornerstone determines the rest of the building. It sets the foundation in place. That means that Jesus himself is the most influential, the deepest layer, the most DNA ingrained part of his own body that makes up his church. We as the body of Jesus Christ, we're not the body of the Father, we're not the body of the Holy Spirit, we're the body of Christ. Jesus is our cornerstone. He has come to us in the name of the Father to bring people into connection with him to the coming kingdom, and he has established his church to continue on. But before we take another step, we have to remember that we don't let go of Jesus in order to do it. He remains our foundation, our cornerstone. It's through him that we know anything about God. We don't make this stuff up. We just point back to Jesus and smile. We testify 
as John the Baptist did before Jesus came. One is coming, coming after me who I am not even worthy to carry his sandals. The church says one came before me who I'm not even worthy to do anything with, and yet he calls me brother or sister. Jesus is the cornerstone of the church. And if you would, please join me as we thank God for the gift of Jesus. I'll speak first and then y'all can read the bold. Jesus is the living stone, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him. Offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. As God spoke ages ago through the prophet Isaiah, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious stone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. For the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Lord Jesus Christ, you are our way, our truth, our life. May you look upon your church approvingly. Lord Jesus Christ, may you recognize your ministry and grace when you see what your church does and how we live. May we stand faithful to you alone. Amen. And then in the words of Jesus Christ himself, after he was raised from the dead, he promised things all the way up till then. He was crucified, raised, and he promised and reminded them even further that God would send them forth the truth teller, the advocate, the power of God, the Holy Spirit. Now, depending on how you were raised, you might have called this part of the Trinity the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, or for our Catholics and Episcopalians out there, the Holy, the Ghost. That always kind of scared me when I was a kid. But what we see in the story of God, many times in his chapters, what he does together, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, allows one portion of himself to take the front stage. When God was doing the chapter of the covenant, Moses talked directly to Yahweh the Father. He had a connection with the Father. That's the part of God who really established the covenant, the Torah from the Mount Sinai to give to the Jews. God the Father was walking and talking with them. And then when Jesus Christ, who was the person of the Trinity that came forefront? The Son. In the era of Christ, God let his Son put on flesh and dwell among us. He had covenant with the Holy Spirit and with the Father, but it was the Son that the world came in contact with most fully. We saw the Son of Man, the Son of God. And in the air of the church, God sends forth part of himself that the world hadn't even quite tasted yet. Who's that? The Holy Spirit. And during this era of the church, the Spirit of God comes and furthers every single thing Jesus taught him because it is still the Spirit of Christ that's within the Holy Spirit that trains us, that teaches us, that gives us our fearlessness, our, our fierceness, our boldness, our patience, our energy, our everything has come through the gift of the Holy Spirit. What I mean is if you don't know the Spirit of the Lord, you're barely churching. The Holy Spirit of God is as important to today as Jesus is and was during the chapter of the Christ. And the church was designed in the image of Jesus to receive this Holy Spirit. Please join me now. And Jesus said, The Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. And you will receive the power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses to the end of the earth as the Hebrews received the gift of the Torah and the Ten Commandments from above. In God's timing, the church received the Holy Spirit from above. In the Holy Spirit, we find our voice, our fearlessness, and our calling to remain faithful to our Lord Jesus Christ all the way to the end. And we know from the beginning that God, for whatever reason, decided to use his word as his primary instrument. You have read Genesis chapter 1, when God created the heavens and the earth. Have you noticed he never lifts a finger? He just says, stars. 
Mountains. <laughs> Oceans. The word of God has power in it. And God has spoken his word. His people have feasted on his word over the ages. He spoke through the prophets. His own son, Jesus, who was with him in the beginning, put on flesh to dwell as the word. That's his first title, the word made flesh. God has always spoken through prophets and evangelists so that God's people might have something to feast upon. And today in the era of the church, he's given us an instrument. Now the church lasted for about 300 years without this instrument. We had the Holy Spirit to guide us and tell us the truth. But over the years, the church received a gift. Can you imagine? Now we functioned without it for a couple of generations. But God granted his people a holy book. And it's through this book, and I'm sure you've had your experiences, that using the Holy Spirit, God has spoken a fresh word to people, to his church. I love the Catholic Church when they say the Bible is an instrument of the Holy Spirit given through the church for the church and not to be used against the church. The Bible was a gift of God for us. It's a great instrument. He continues to speak through it today. When Jesus was a baby, where did they lay him? In the manger. Consider this a manger. That in the power of the Holy Spirit, when you are listening for God's word amidst these words watch Christ come and lay on these pages he's there because he is God's word in gratitude Lord we thank you for your word which is a lamp for our feet and a light on our path as your word became alive in Jesus, we now receive your word through the scriptures and through Christ's spirit. We understand that we do not live by bread alone, but by every word you speak, Father. Therefore, we will not merely listen to the word and so deceive ourselves, but actually live by what it says. We remember the words of Jesus when he reminded us that heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. For we know that your word is trustworthy and true. And then the greatest miracle of all. You know, for God to part the Red Sea, to feed the 5,000, that's a snap for him. But to get a human being to work alongside him, that's a miracle. We are the most rebellious of the species. We think we know it all. We get confused, we get lost, and at the same time, we bear the image of God, and he chooses us to be the ones to walk and to work alongside him. And so in addition to the Son, to the Holy Spirit, and to the Word, God brought together a people. Through holy baptism, God says, or St. Paul teaches in Galatians, that we are no longer Jews or Greeks. We're no longer male nor female. We're no longer slave or free. We are one in Christ. God made a people. Who would have thought? Who would have thought? Republicans and Democrats. Aggies and Red Raiders. People from any chapter in, in separation and line, we want to let the world set up for us. God said, I have a spirit who knows no boundaries. Across languages, ages, abilities, God has brought together the unity in the body. The church is the people. I've heard y'all say many times, I don't know what I would do without my church. And who are you talking about? each other. We are a living body, a living organism. We are the living stones of Jesus Christ put together, assembled, and just take a snapshot, whether you're looking at a youth group, at your college group, at a congregation, what God has here right now is what he wanted here right now. This is a living organism across the globe. We are over one billion strong. We, we span time. We have communion with the saints who are in heaven and those who are going to come after us. 
We are intimately linked with every Christian who ever was, who ever will be through holy baptism. God has made us one living organism. We shift and we change and we look funny and all sorts of things go back and forth and ups and downs. But we are who God wants us to be right in this moment because he doesn't bring us on as he thinks we should be, but he brings us on as we are. He has brought together a people. And as many of you know this saying, please remember, let us refuse to go to church so that we might become the church. Quit telling people I'm going to church and start telling people I am the church. Please rise. Renew your church, our ministries restore. Make us again as salt throughout the land and as light from a stand. Send us forth with power endued. Help us, God, be renewed. Teach us your word. Reveal its truth divine. Tell of your works, your mighty acts of grace. As you have sent your Christ to save and love to triumph over the grave, let our hearts with love be stirred. Help us, God, know your word. Teach us to pray, for you are ever near. Our souls are restless until they rest in you. Before your presence, keep us still, that we may find for us your will. Teach us, God, how to pray. Teach us how to love with strength of heart and mind. Break down old walls of hate as you have loved and given your life to end hostility. Share your grace from heaven above. Teach us, God, how to love. Would you please?